We write alone, but are we ever really alone? The answer may surprise you. Mystery and crime writers imagine the dead in many creative ways. But what if our earthbound creativity is actually evidence of otherworldly voices? With the help of author and medium Carolyn Marie Wilkins, we explore the unseen energies that fuel creativity and transcend writer's block. Maybe it's communicating with the dead that makes our writing come alive. You're a spiritualist and a medium. That's right. You're a musician. Yeah. And you're an author. Yes. We're here in Salem, Massachusetts. How much, how great is that? I know. Talk to me a little bit about being a medium and a spiritualist and how did you know you were? <laughs> great you <know>? question. <laughs> I have always had, I think like most of us, some psychic in abilities and moments where I just knew things about people without knowing how I've known them. And I will say that whole ability to sort of bypass the conscious mind where we feel like we figure everything out mm -hmm. and go instead to a place where we receive from a spirit or whatever you want to call it, that is the ground of being both at, for mediums, for psychics, for any kind of improvisatory art, like a jazz musician, which I also am, but also for writers. Talk to me about that transition away from the conscious into that realm. And it's something about being able to relax, to let go of control, and to allow the mind to move out of the way so that the spirit or the creative energy or the muse or whatever word you want to use for that is going to flow through. The last hmm. time I decided to start a new story, I just wrote, I put myself in a zone, I started writing, and I did not stop until like I kind of set a timer and said, okay, for the next two hours, I'm just going to write stuff. And I'm not going to worry about if it makes any sense, mm -hmm. if it spells, mm -hmm. if it's spelled correctly, if it goes and it's completely <laughs> illogical. We call I'm that writing gonna, crap. We yeah. allow ourselves to just write, write crap. It. And what I found was that afterwards, amazingly, when I read it, not that it was perfect by any means, but it was far more coherent than I had thought it would mm -hmm. be. And there were great ideas in Excellent. there because yep. my thinking brain had not had an opportunity to like derail the process. Because otherwise, as you say, we're looking and going, oh, Maybe I should put this part of the sentence first before the, I mean, there's a time for that, mm -hmm. but it's usually much later in the process than right. we think. Right. Good writing is its own form of mediumship. Were I to be reading uh, one of your deceased loved ones, that's what would happen. They would just begin to appear and I would have a sense of a person and I would begin describing a personality almost as we do with a character. So in, in many ways, it's kind of the same thing. You know, it reminds me of, you know, in photography, we used to put the thing in the developing fluid mm -hmm. and very gradually the picture mm -hmm. would emerge. It's the same way in mediumship, and I find it's the same way with my characters. They begin to emerge, and I'm sure you've had this happen. They start talking to you, and before you know it, you're writing and having them say and do things. Right, they take over. So I, what I'm wondering is um, when these characters take over and they're mm -hmm. so determined to mm -hmm. be heard, yes. I'm wondering if it's not just a grandfather or an ancestor that we might have had an inkling of. Mm -hmm. I'm really wondering if that's someone who's saying, I need to be heard. I'm not part of this realm anymore, of your realm anymore, right. but my story is important. That's right. Absolutely could very well. Wow. 
That's amazing. There does become almost a fine line between research and, you know, as you know, when you're writing a book, you're immersing yourself in the period and in the location and all this, and you're steeping yourself in that. And who's to say that that some energy from that time or place wouldn't make itself known to you and say, I want to be in your story. Right. Because I had an incredible experience when I was writing my um, first and second novel, um, Charity and the Troubles. And it was a story about a woman um, connecting with her mother that she didn't know was a mother, her Irish ancestry. And it was fiction to me. Right. And as I wrote the mother's story, who was born in 1910, 1920, mm. and growing up through the Irish Troubles, as I wrote that story and the two timelines merged, mm. I realized as I was writing this and I found out afterwards, I was actually writing part of my family's history that I didn't know at the time. Well, see, and I will say the ancestors, these are your ancestors, mm -hmm. right? They are always, this is medium Carolyn talking, but they are always trying to come through and say hello. And they really want to help us mm -hmm. in our work here in the world. And ancestors generally tend to love that we're doing creative things quite often. They aspire to do them, but they didn't maybe have the chance, particularly the women they weren't always able to do things that they dreamed of doing. And so now here you are writing this book. You know they're going to come through and say, you know, come on. Well, I, I didn't know it at the time, but no, all of a sudden no. I found it. <laughs> but there it is. There it is. Because the difference, and this is how we began our conversation, mm -hmm. the difference between mediumship, quote unquote, and writing or any kind of really creative art is very thin. The, mm -hmm. the boundary is very thin. They're very mm -hmm. similar. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of magical. That's, it's a form cool. of magic. After talking about the invisible energies that surround us, I wondered if there is a way to see those powers at work. We took in more of Salem sights as we walked to a local restaurant for a private reading. So I see that you've brought your tarot cards. So I need to know if there's some <laughs> magic here uh, that can happen, not necessarily magic, but if there's something that we can learn from you and a tarot reading that'll help all authors. Yes, I brought especially my African-American tarot deck, which is a gorgeous deck. And the whole thing with reading tarot cards is that tarot is a way of, it is a language, but it's not a verbal language, right? It's a nonverbal language. It's the language of symbol and metaphor in the subconscious. And that is where your inner critic actually lives, right? Mm -hmm. In the subconscious, mm -hmm. it's the writer's block is actually lurking in there. And what I have found to be very helpful is to do readings for creative people to help them get down to what are the things that may be stopping them uh, from doing their best creative work. And those things are quite often uncovered in the tarot. So what I'm gonna do, rather than doing one personally That's for you, uh, for sort of the collective who's gonna watch this later, and the question is going to be, speak about, uh, what do we need to know about writer's block? And for those of you who are fans of the tarot, uh, this uses many of the same symbols and, whoa, look at there, and something is already wanting to come out. I'm gonna, oh, leave, wow. him, huh. I'm gonna leave him out because he couldn't wait until I got there and look, there's two. Oh, oh okay. my God, these cards are beautiful. Aren't they gorgeous? Yes. I love this deck. I basically don't pay too much attention to the literal meaning of the cards and more sort of I allow my psychic senses to just kind of riff on them. So this is the Nine of Wands. This is a warrior. Uh, we think of this as Shango, who is an African king who has the double-edged 
ax, but he's waiting right here. He's waiting for developments. And I feel that sometimes when we have writer's block, we are sort of in that place of sort of wanting things to happen, but we're not patient with just waiting to allow the spirit to come and bring a download. And sometimes we're like, Arr! right, yeah. Cause sometimes I think about it, that it needs, our ideas need time to ripen. There that, you go. Yes, it right. takes mm -hmm, time. Mm -hmm. And so what he's showing us here is waiting. He's waiting. And up here in the very top of the card, you have a, an African ancestor. And this woman here is one of the first black women to become a doctor. And so what that says to me is the importance of patience, mm -hmm. of gentleness, mm -hmm. of being kind and nurturing with each other rather than, you know, come and on, let's go. And yourself, because I, the most self critical people are authors on themselves. Of course. The next card is the four of wands and once again these are wands are cards of energy and power they kind of have a fire energy here we have a chief and up here an ancestor giving a speech what this says to me is that there is leadership and rulership involved so waiting but at the same time taking ownership and taking rulership so it's that balance of both being passive and being active and uh -huh. that flows into the next card which is the eight of cups and here we have uh, a man who's basically giving a speech so once again once you've waited you've allowed it to ripen You've taken ownership and said, I'm in charge of my world, and to begin to really proclaim it. But it's a process. You don't do this one before you've done this one. Mm -hmm. And then hmm. the last card here, the which wanted to be seen, this one, the Five of Swords, uh, is an admonition not to get too comfortable sitting on your laurels, because here is this warrior right he's killed this tiger and the tiger is dead but little does he know oh, lurking in the woods is a lion yeah just lurking right just waiting and up here we have a civil rights figure being led away in handcuffs once again the idea that we need to be aware that there are going to be challenges, there are going to be dangers, there are going to be situations, and you don't want to ever like drop your guard. So since we're not really slaying lions per se, it is first of all, waiting on the spirit and allowing the intuition to come in and being kind and gentle with ourselves taking ownership of our world and letting that part of us that's the king the ruler go ahead and take over proclaiming what we have and not being afraid to speak our truth and proclaim it and say ta-da this is who i am and this is what i do each one of these things is a step So this is your book, Death at a Seance, and I know that the main character is also a psychic. Absolutely. So I would assume that you kind of channeled this story in, and does she do, do um, the does she do the piano trance as well? No, she's not a musician, although she does. I don't want to give too much of the story away, but there is a moment where she channels a song. So, so talk to me about piano trance. This is a new thing that I've begun offering. It's called piano trance healing and basically consists of three elements. The piano, me going into a trance state, i.e. an altered state of mind, and then 
the healing that results from the sounds that are made. What I do is I pull a tarot card, which sets the intention, mm -hmm. uh, and then they come through and they play through me on whatever the topic of the tarot card or further extrapolation of the energy of the card and share that in a musical form. It doesn't sound like regular music. It's very different. It's completely improvised. I have no idea what it's going to be. So, but that's the piano chance. Oh, fascinating. So my character mm -hmm. does not play the piano, but she does every once in a while. She's still in training. She's a young girl, so she's got lessons to learn. But every once in a while, she gets an inspiration and something takes her over. And that is, uh, yeah, that's oh, the that's mediumship. It. That settles it. The creative process for any art form may remain a mystery, but I hope today's conversation helps you understand those voices in our heads and why characters demand to take over our story. Mm -hmm.